Great to be back here. Thanks, Hugh, for giving me the opportunity to talk on my new project. And um, I am a megalithomaniac. That's, that's true. And I'll explain to you uh, the link between uh, the new book. Um, well, it'll become obvious, actually. There's certainly a lot of megaliths and a lot of... Hugh mentioned the takeover and the destruction of sacred sites generally. But um, I'll, hopefully I'll go into some specifics today. This is the first time I've ever done this talk, so be gentle with me. Okay. So the real magic uh, lies not in seeking new landscapes, but in seeing what's already around us with new eyes. That's been the story of my life. Really. I've had 20 years of studying ley lines, earth energies, sacred sites. And along those alignments and sacred sites, of course, as you do, you find lots of churches, don't you? There's no mystery here. The church is built on the sites, uh, on, on the ancient sites. But uh, of course, I started going in those churches and finding how empowered they are with earth energies. And then and the next step was really looking at the symbolism. And of course, a lot of the symbolism, especially left there by the Knights Templars and other people, uh, tell a very uh, different, uh, sort of more Gnostic story than uh, we are led to believe. And this got me looking into the whole subject of symbolism which I've done really on and off the last 20 years. And um, in the next hour, hopefully I'll just give you a little glimpse of, of what I've been up to, because I think it's a fascinating subject, and it's a subject that needs telling today, for sure. So, um, difference, I'm, I'm talking talk about symbols and myths. Straight away, I need to say, what's the difference between a sign and a symbol? There is a difference. Signs are designed to be appreciated and understood in a split second, regardless of the language or belief system. In, in, they are instruction, advice, or a warning sometimes. Symbols, on the other hand, uh, may be embellished with endless meanings. Um, interpretations and mystery, often beyond the grasp of the rational mind. So symbols are much deeper uh, and work on our psyche more. Um, the great thing about myths is that they are always pregnant with new meanings. You can go back to a, a myth and a symbol many, many times and get more out of it because, of course, when we go back to that symbol or myth, we too are in a, a new space, possibly to receive new wisdom. And I think that has always been the case going back thousands of years. Confucius, he says, signs and symbols rule the world, not words or laws. So I must apologize from the outset. There's loads of subjects I can't deal with today because I've just got one hour, but um, I look into virtually every kind of symbol in each category that you could ever wish to see. Uh, but again, apologies that I won't be able to go into those, but I'm gonna, gonna go into what I think are some of the key elements that were taken over by Christianity to tell their story. So um, the first section I call nature symbolism. There is symbolism and sacred geometry in the whole of nature, and this is where man first got his idea. So the genesis of man's preoccupation with symbols uh, occurs in nature. We see it in the hexagram, the Fibonacci sequence here and here, and the lovely spirals and the beautiful symmetry and mathematics in the whole of nature. So um, this is where, of course, this is the original symbolism, and this is where man got the idea. He picked up by observing all these and sought to copy those, if you like. Like, um, to tell his own story. So symbolism occurs naturally. I, I found these on my travels. Uh, aren't these amazing? These are natural. These are all natural rocks um, which were used by man uh, for more sacred purpose in the Neolithic and Bronze Age as a tomb. This is the, uh, the elephant dolmen. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? That's a natural structure. And this one looks like a huge mushroom. Uh, can't be bad, can it? A 15-foot high magic mushroom, yay! So, um, and you can sit under there. Uh, if, I, if I stood up there, I'd be up to about there. So this is huge. And this is one a bit nearer home on Dartmoor. This is Vixen Tor. And this is Vixen Tor that is actually looking straight at the Maryvale Stone Circle. So again, we've got lots of um, signs that man was, was getting in tune, which things that he would be seen as gifts from the goddess. Uh, sacred symbols go back um, thousands of years, 36, 45,000 years. We've got evidence of symbolism. Uh, the famous Venuses, of course, uh, and, and rock art, uh, still carried on by Aboriginals today. This, this, this caving from Lasor, I think, dates back 35,000 years. Uh, this shapeshifter changing into a bird. He's facing up to this huge bull with his phallus erect. Good luck there, mate. So, um, so you see, people are telling, this is probably sympathetic magic that magic they're looking to entice the bull, of course, to give up his life for the hunt. So symbolism goes back many, many thousands of years, right to the dawn of man's observations of nature. And Hugh mentioned Gebekli Tepe. Uh, so going back 9,000 years, we have images and symbols um, 
uh, at Gebekli Tepe, that fantastic site you mentioned. And I think recently there's been study of the, um, of the so-called totem megalith, which is absolutely stuffed full of animals and symbols at Gebekli Tepe. And of course, symbolism reaches a, a climax, if you like, uh, with Tutankhamun's mask. I mean, isn't it, you, no matter how many times you see that, it just gets you, doesn't it? And of course, that's the idea, I guess. Um, a bit, bit near in time, uh, symbolism occurs in megaliths at Abri. When I take people on my tours of Abri, you can see this one here. This is called the Shark Stone, and you can see why. And this one on my tours of Malta, I found that around the, the goddess temples, and they are officially called goddess temples by archaeologists, there's always one phallic-shaped stone at the back of the temple to give it that yang element. It's all about the balance of yin and yang in ancient cultures. And uh, of course, we have lots of lozenges. This is four knocks in Ireland. You know, what do these mean? They're open to so much interpretation. And this is the beauty and the power of mythology. And of course, this is the famous Gundestrop cauldron, said to be Sununus, um, or else a shaman sitting cross-legged. So uh, the amount of symbolism right through man's history uh, is, is amazing. And a picture really does tell a thousand words, and I think this is why symbols can be so powerful. All um, companies and corporations today, don't they? They use logos, because in a split second, you know what that shop is. So, and you know, that's been going on forever, really. Um, my previous book about the CERN giant looked at landscape symbolism. So people aren't just making figurines and painting on walls. Sometimes they use the landscape itself, the famous white horse at Uffington there and uh, the CERN giant here, uh, two huge and ancient. We both, both know that these are both now prehistoric and uh, so sometimes the whole landscape could be used uh, as, as a backwash really, as a board to create symbols. So symbolism can be on a huge scale at times. So uh, <clears throat> then cometh Christianity and um, uh, Cometh the cross, I call this section. Christianity absorbed ancient and universal symbols and myths to help promote its own agenda. And why wouldn't you? You're going to use symbols uh, that are familiar to people to tell your own story. And all religions do this, I think. You know, you're, you're, you're tapping into archetypes, really, which are already familiar to people. And then you can tell you, promote your own agenda because of that. But there is a difference between Christian literalists and the very ancient uh, Gnostic allergies of myths. Um, and of course, later, all the Gnostic Gospels were denied. You had, there was a set, set of Gospels, and all the others weren't just ignored. They were actually uh, trashed seriously. So um, Christian literalists uh, really take the bos Gospel uh, as, uh, as, as Gospel, if you like, <laughs> take the Bible as Gospel. Whereas uh, in all the ancient cultures, they always knew that these old myths and gods and goddesses were just allegories to help tell a story and uh, you can see why that, those were taken on. So uh, one example um, to Christian literalists, of course, Jesus is just reborn once. But of course, he took over from all the old sun gods that are perpetually born and die and are reborn. That's the, that's, the, uh, that's the point. And I think the big change between Christianity and all the religions that had come before, it was the denial and the degradation of the divine feminine. And I think that for the last 2,000 years, we have been seriously paying the price for that, men included. So um, I'll touch on that later. Um, there's a new god in town is the next section. Uh, an edict from Pope Gregory in 595 uh, said, let's not, um, well, they were having a job converting right across Europe, converting people to Christianity. Um, and he said, okay, well, we won't destroy the old pagan sites. Let's put our sites on them. And what a shrewd move that was, I tell you. So there's a few examples from here. There's many in the book. This is Knowlton in Dorset, a Neolithic henge with a Norman church slapped right in the middle. So people can still come to their old sacred site, but there's a new God in town. So it makes the idea of conversion, I think, much easier. And of course, in the early phases of Christianity, especially the Celtic Christianity, sometimes there was very little difference between paganism and uh, Christianity, really. They're following the cycles, agricultural. Uh, we have it on record that many Druids uh, converted to the early stage of Christianity because they could just see it was the sun god, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, repackaged. Um, but of course, it was the later phase of missionaries from Rome, that where it all went um, seriously downhill, I would suggest. This is another uh, excellent Neolithic temple at uh, Jersey with a chapel on the top. And this is one I found in Portugal. This is actually a dolmen, and the chapel has been built right in there, and the energies in there are amazing. And, um, you know, so th there are many examples right around Europe of 
uh, Christianity taking over the ancient sites. And of course, it, what the next section is the turning year in the book. And it's not just the sacred sites they took over, but of course, it's all the festivals as well. Uh, virtually every festival you can think of is, is, the, is the usurp of a, of a pagan site. Halloween, of course, is the, uh, is the old Celtic New Year, Samhain. And uh, Easter, for instance, uh, we never know when Easter's going to be, do you? Does anybody know when Easter is next year? No. Uh, Easter is always the, the first Sunday after the first full moon after equinox. It's lunar-based, you know? So, uh, of course, we have lots of ancient gods who are also reborn at Easter. And Christmas, I'll come on to Christmas later. Um, Christmas is a fascinating one. I'm going to leave that one. But all these ancient festivals, which, of course, had been running for many thousands of years, had to be taken over and Christianized. Um, I'll pick out a few different categories. Angels. We all think of angels. We've all seen images of angels and cherubs, and uh, that angels tend to turn up at monumental moments during the Bible. But of course, they are much older. This is Mat, the winged goddess of Egypt. Lilith. Um, is, she was uh, associated with the owl. She's the original lady of the night. So, um, very sexual goddess, uh, um, which I'll talk about later. Again, she's a winged creature. And, of course, he's Eros. These are all hundreds, if not thousands, of years before Christianity. So, the idea of a winged divine creature or semi-divine helping the gods out, or in this case, the god, is very ancient indeed. And... Um, Another example of many I could have shown, this is St. Michael, often shown with scales. He's weighing you to, when you go to heaven, he's weighing you to see whether you'd be naughty or nice, a bit like Santa. So, um, but it was going on thousands of years before that. Here's the Pharaoh's uh, heart there, and of course, is the feather going to weigh the heart of the, uh, weigh down the heart of the, the Pharaoh? Of course it is, he's been a good man. So, um, again, the idea of having your soul and your deeds weighed up is much older than Christianity. But this was seen to be so powerful that Christianity adopted it. This is absolutely stunning, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful window there. Creation. Um, again, all ancient cultures have their creation myth, and Aboriginal cultures today all have their creation myths, trying to explain how we got there, how the universe came into being. There's some common threads. They nearly all regard water, and they nearly always regard something called the deep, which is taken to be uh, being the deepness of the water from which everything uh, emerged. But I found several Babylonian goddesses uh, who are also known as the deep one and the deep. Uh, and, uh, of course, they inevitably lead to the first couple. But what is missing in the Judaic Christianity creation myths, again, is the goddess. The goddess is at the start of all the ancient creation myths, except for the ones, the new religions, should I say. So uh, here's the, uh, crea uh, is the, the creator god from the Aborigines. This is an Egyptian one. This is the famous Aztec uh, calendar stone, all talking about the creation. Um, during that chapter, I look at the Big Bang, um, something from nothing. Um, what a wonderful concept. Uh, and of course, people, are, are, um, people have been talking about this for thousands of years, where the God, the creator God, or the divine spark creates something from nothing. By, by thought. And uh, dark matter, of course, is, is very much being bandied about by scientists now. They've worked out that 75% of the universe is dark matter. We'll never see it. Um, so, you know, what are they talking about? Are they talking about God? Are they talking about the divine spark? You know, that which is moving and controlling everything. It's very spiritual, actually, isn't it? When the more you read about dark matter, there's something uh, very mystical about it. And in 1951, Pope Pius XII actually decreed that the Big Bang Theory need not conflict with the Catholic concept of creation. At this point, you're all supposed to go, ooh. So there isn't a conflict anymore. Fabulous. That got sneaked in on the bottom of a particular um, you know, um, newsletter. But uh, yes, that pope didn't see any concept with uh, the Big Bang Theory. Uh, so it seems that creationists and scientists are actually perhaps finding some common ground. Um, in a lot of ancient religions, although most of them are, uh, uh, believe in more than one gods and, and lots of gods, they're not monotheistic, um, there's usually one god on high. And of course, this was taken on as being the one and only god by Christianity. But there's lots of them. God sitting on a throne. This is a Christian window. And uh, of course, this is uh, Horus um, uh, sitting on the throne. This is Zeus sitting on a throne, commanding the universe. And this is Jupiter. So this concept, of course, would have been known. The, these images of these gods, Gods sitting in temples on thrones, of course, would have been seen by all the Christians. All the early Christian ministries that went out would have seen all these symbols. So it's no, it's no um, mystery, really, that um, God is depicted in a similar way. 
Um, the tree of life and the first people, uh, the, 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 the idea of a tree of life, the axis mundi, the cosmic tree, that which links the earth to the heavens and also uh, you know, represents the kundalini, is so ancient, it's unbelievable. The Babylonian one there, Egyptian, the, uh, the Kabbalah, of course, of Judaism. These are two Neolithic trees of life that I found uh, on Malta. So there's this idea that something is connecting us uh, to the heavens, if you like, or to more ethereal divine sources is very, very ancient indeed. Uh, this is one from Babylonia, 3000 BC. There's two dudes who seriously need a haircut um, standing either side of their tree of life. And it's often seen as a pillar. Uh, and this is at the famous Lion's Gate, of course. We know in Lion Gate, there's the pillar, the axis. And uh, this is the famous one from Roslyn Chapel, where it's like the DNA strands are going round it. But the idea is that it's a pillar. And there's dragons at the bottom. All of this foliage is issuing from dragons representing the life force of the planet, and I'll deal with dragons very shortly. And this is a tree, I found this interesting one. This is a scene of the crucifixion, and it's actually a living tree on which Jesus is hanging, a living tree. And there are the words Arbe Vitae, tree of life. So again, you can actually find you know, relics of, of uh, this ancient concept in Christian architecture, if you know where to look. So of course, Adam and Eve, um, the, first pe the first people, and, and the, the idea of the first two people occurs in all creation myths, because obviously uh, all cultures have to explain where the first two ancestors came from. Um, this is interesting, uh, uh, Eve is created, remember Eve, we all read your Bible, don't you, every day? I'm sure you do, of course you do. Um, Eve, of course, was made from Adam's rib. And of course, I found a Sumerian myth, of course, that's where a lot of the Judaic myths came from, from Samaria after the captivity. I found a Sumerian myth with Enki, the go uh, is, is the lady of the rib. She's created from the rib of a god. So when you look, everything comes from something else. Um, but, of course, the ancient celebration of life and its cycles is to do with the divine couple and rebirth. So before we had Aphrodite and Adonis, Ishtar and Tammuz, Isis and Osiris, all about rebirth and the cycles of life and the tree of life being reborn, was turned into a rather depressing story of Adam and Eve and, of course, original sin. And I think women and men, too, have never recovered from that. You know, this, this fabulous story of the tree of life and the creation. Look at the bountifulness of that. And of course, the serpent, he's the serpent of wisdom turned into the serpent of evil. And uh, I just think it's very sad, very sad. Um, the Green Man uh, is another one I picked out for this talk. I could have easily picked out a lot more concepts, but he's very ancient. Um, here's the, the dude here, um, Geb, he's the, the ancient earth god, often painted as green in Egyptian. There's Newt, his sister and consort. Egyptians often had sisters as consorts, they like that sort of thing. Um, so here you can see the divine marriage and rather proud looking chap he is. Uh, this is Osiris, nearly always shown in a bluey green or a blue face if you've got the original recordings. He's the original earth man, the uh, green man of Egyptian cultures. Green Tara, some of you have no doubt seen. Um, again, a lot of um, Indian and Hindu gods tend to have green or bluish faces. And I found this one from Islam, al Khidir. He's known as the green one. Always wore green clothes, uh, very much to do with fecundity and healing, and used to walk around with a fish. Yeah, the fish, where have we seen that? Um, you know, walking around with a fish all day, I don't know whether he actually got many friends in his life, but uh, is, you can see where the idea of a fish came from. So, um, and of course, there's some classic green men. I've got to think all the real classic green men in my book. This is one I had the pleasure of seeing. Have you, have you all been to see this one at Roslyn? He actually hangs over you, suspends over you, and opens up your soul, he really does. And uh, this is a really light, light one from where I live in Wiltshire, and this is a fabulous one from Dorset. All these are in the book. And um, of course, by bringing the green man into the church, by bringing this face of the fecundity of nature into the church, it's now not the gods of the fields that are blessing the crops. It's now, of course, the Christian God that is blessing the crops. That is the idea of bringing the green man into the church. So, um, but these are, these are amazing images. This one is so lifelike, it's unreal. It's uh, very powerful. You know, when these green men look back at you, they really do set, you know, they do, it is the, the soul of nature staring into your, into your inner being. So um, the phallus, I call this section, the staff of life. 
It certainly is. Again, there's Geb. Again, I've turned that a bit sideways just because I felt like it. And uh, this is Priapus, the old classical god, well-blessed guy. I bet, he, bet buying trousers for him is a nightmare. Um, and this, this is uh, Min, again, another fertility god, all associated with fertility. And of course, I did the book on the CERN giant. And it's very little to do with sex either. People see a lot of these phallic images and they say, oh, it was all to do with sex and orgies. Well, perhaps in some cases it was. But uh, usually you, you're asking the gods to fertilize the land for you. That's the whole point. You want the phallus of the god, the staff of life, to come down and fertilize your fields. That's what it's all about. And, um, and this, I can only, I can, wow, oh my God, is the only thing I can say to this one. There's me, six foot one of me. This is the famous uh, dolmen in North Brittany. And, you know, how can this be meant to be anything else but a phallus? And, of course, I say to people when I take them on my tours, when I show them stones like this around Avery, you have to ask the question, it, it is a phallus, certainly, an erect phallus, but, of course, the other end of the phallus is going into the ground. It's fertilizing the earth, isn't it? So you must look at phallic stones two ways. Is it, is it erect to the skies, or is the other end of it fertilizing Mother Earth? Uh, this is a Roman one. Hermes was also a phallic god. These are milestones. These were old ancient road signs. Can you imagine if we had those on our road signs today? This one is clearly saying, go straight ahead, isn't it? <laughs> So, um, and this is a, a Japanese Shinto festival still going on today where this 12 foot high pink phallus, um, which I think they purchased from, from some, I don't know, it looks like, I don't know, let's not even go there. But this is paraded around by the local street. Ann Summers was the word I was trying to think of. Um, this is the Ann Summers festival in Japan every year. And uh, this, this, they, the whole community turns out, men, women, it's an ancient Shinto festival. It's all about fertility of the land and fertility of the community too. So, um, and I, I found, I discovered this when I did my CERN giant book. Uh, these are the two hills in the CERN Valley. One is called Weem Common Hill, overlooking the giant. This is a pregnant shaped hill, and Weem in old ancient English means, means the uterus or the womb. Yeah? Right opposite where the giant is on the hill. And look at the shape of this hill. Need I say more? So if I've spotted this, you can bet your life the Druids spotted that uh, 2,000 years ago. So even the landscape phallicism is used. All the shaded areas, all the land over 150 meters. So you can see, um, and the giant is right on the tip of that phallus. Landscape symbolism too. And, uh, and again, uh, in that book I show how Orion uh, rises above the, uh, the, uh, the CERN giant, only 2,000 years ago. Only did that happen. It's very time-specific, doesn't happen now. So it's the stellar giant rising over the landscape giant. So Orion in ancient cultures was regarded, uh, the constellation was regarded either as Log, uh, Orion, Log, Bran, all these different gods and goddesses were, were known to be Orion in the sky. Um, so again, whoever's coming along here over the last 2,000 years will recognize this archetype and will also recognize that archetype because they've all got the equivalent in their own pantheon of gods. So um, another thing that was taken over from Priapus and Attis uh, fertility festivals in Greek and Rome is, is, the, uh, is the maypole. So next time you go to a fete and all these children are dancing around the maypole, don't, whatever you do, tell one of their parents that they're dancing around a huge phallus, okay, or else the police will roll up. Okay, so, but that is what, in effect, they're doing. Uh, well, I found evidence in ancient Rome of, phall of, of phallic maypoles being erected. It is not a Christian tradition at all. It was around at least 500 years before Christianity came on. But maypoles are nearly always erected um, in, in the spring. It's the fertility time of the year. So, yes, we have phalluses in Christian architecture. All these images are Christian, I kid you not, especially in France. Uh, France-like phalluses, apparently. Anybody from France here? No? Oh, good. Um, so th the biggest collection of um, phalluses is in France. Now, that sounds bad, doesn't it? Uh, the big, uh, Christian architecture. I mean, this one, these leave very little to the imagination. I look about the origins of these in the book. And uh, originally in the early churches, the Templar churches, the earlier Saxon churches, I think, again, it's bringing the old images of, of fertility into the church to show that it's now God that blesses the fields. But, of course, later on, when Roman Catholicism has more of a pull and the later cathedrals go up, and everything. Of course, these are used as sins, uh, uh, a warning of sins of the flesh. So it just shows how the same images can be used to represent different things. These are supposed to remind people not to go there. I'm thinking, what? 
you know, would you, if you had a, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, would you set up a bar in the corner of the room? You know, why are they showing images representing what you're not supposed to do? So, um, and again, um, it just, these are all Christian images. It's quite fabulous, really, isn't it? Um, so as well as the, the equivalent of the male phallus, of course, is the divine yoni. And this, this idea of a sacred opening, the vulva of the goddess, is so ancient. This is St. Nectan's le uh, Glen, where the water literally cascades to the yoni of the goddess. This is a broccoli cave near Bristol, where we do shamanic drumming in there. Again, the vulva of the earth mother. This is one we perceived at Avery. Uh, again, this great gash is, is uh, thousands of years old, representing the vault of the Earth Mother. Of course, Menantol, which you can go through there for initiation. And again, it's shown on a lot of ancient figurines. So the, the idea of the divine yoni, that everything issues from that, uh, and the fecundity of the land um, has its divine feminine equivalent. And again, we have them in Christian architecture. Again, later on to represent symbol, uh, symbol, sins of the flesh, but uh, earlier on I think they represented something much different. Canterbury Cathedral, uh, this one here, I forget where that is, but this one is in Roslyn Chapel. And of course, they think a lot of these uh, carvings in Roslyn were done by the Knights Templars. There's the sword there, possibly representing Excalibur, other esoteric images, and there's the shield in a gig. Um, exposing herself again in a Christian cave. And this is the most famous one in the world. If you haven't been to see this one, please go. It's fantastic. At Kilpeck, uh, it's just a few feet above your head. Very alien-like, isn't it? Isn't that just? And even the eyes are the shape of the yoni. So, um, and again, the, the, there is a lot of evidence that um, there's a lot of shielding gigs around the country which have been, their vulva has been worn smooth by people in the recent centuries, in Christian times, robbing the yoni for good luck. Some of them are practically worn away. So clearly this is a modern tradition where the newlywed wives would rub the yoni to induce fertility. So, but that's a very ancient practice. And of course, if you, if you extrapolate the yoni, which is that space there, you get the, the vesica pisces. There's the yoni still there, later developed into the fish by Christianity. And of course, sacred geometry, you find this in megalithic sites and churches. Here at Glastonbury in the Abbey, we're going to look at this tomorrow. This, of course, uh, we're going here in the Chalice Well Gardens. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, these, again, are open to interpretation. And I always say everybody's interpretation is right. You know, this is the beauty of symbols. You know, is it this world and the... Uh, the, the spirit world, and they come together in harmony. You know, is it yin? Is it yang? So again, nobody's right on these because these are all multifaceted, multidimensional. And of course, by, this is where they get the Christian fish from, and sometimes with Jesus' name inside. So uh, the fish that um, good Christian folk take around them is actually a, a, a reinvention of the, phal of the yoni. So. Don't tell them whatever you do. Um, uh, I found across a lot of symbols like this. This is called the areoli or the nimbus. You often find Jesus and sometimes God standing in front of this. Have you ever seen this in stained glass windows? It's kind of focusing and there's all this fire and brimstone and all this light, of course, because he's representing the sun. But I found this way back. This is a Hindu one here. This is a, a Greek one, Helios, the sun god, inside this nimbus. And this is Buddha, often, sat, often stands in front of this lotus leaf, but of course, course, it's the same thing. They're all the same, different cultures, different times, using the same picture. So, of course, when Christianity came along, it knew all about these other symbols, and of course, it wanted to put their main dude center stage in a similar symbol. Uh, I looked at the halo and found, of course, halos are, we think of halos, you know, every Christian saint and Jesus and Mary, they all have a halo around their head. It represents divinity, uh, and, but of course, it's in Buddha. Buddha has a head around there. Uh, you often find these sun disks on some of the Egyptian gods. I think that's the true origin of the halo. I do. I really do. Um, that disk there. A lot of sun gods have that around their heads. This is a Hittite one. Again, there's the halo. And of course, this is Artemis, uh, the Greek goddess, again, um, with a halo around. So again, everything comes from something else. Things are much older than you think, including myself. Right. So um, this is Buddha again, this, 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 uh, with two uh, god and a goddess. I forget they're almost unpronounceable Hindu names, but uh, you can see there's the halo representing the sun. He's a sun god. He's an enlightened being. This is a Mayan uh, goddess. I forget her name. I found this in um, Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. Again, there's an arc like a halo. And this one, you might be, if I was to tell you that's Jesus, you know, on a Roman plate or something, I could probably fool you, couldn't I? But that's actually Apollo 
that's uh, classical god Apollo. So you can see where things come from because of course Jesus took over the role of the sun god. So we had to have a halo. So um, the spiral is another one I thought I'd put in today. Of course, spirals occur in nature on a tiny level, on a huge level. This is an Egyptian pot with spirals on, I found in Birmingham. And of course, the famous spirals at Newgrange and other Neolithic sites. These are the famous Scottish, uh, said to be the platonic solids, these amazing balls. I, I went to, if you want to see a collection of these, Edinburgh Museum has got a, a whole heap of these right in front of you. Fabulous. And of course, the Nazca lines as well. Uh, some of the glyphs have spiraling tiles. So the spiral, it, it, it represents the, the, the eternal cycles of life. You know, as you go around to one side, it comes back and it represents reincarnation and the perpetual changes of nature. And of course, all the, also the unfolding Fibonacci sequence, which opens with mathematical form. So very ancient concept spirals, but used in Christianity and much later. Here's uh, spirals on an early Christian cross, used extensively uh, for decoration. Um, this is a famous one on the St. Michael line in Cornwall. This spiral is, is occupying, of course, the third eye position. And what's this doing on a Christian font? You know, so again, um, we have to look at things with a more ancient origin. And uh, again, this could easily be the spirals from Newgrange, couldn't it, <laughs> uh, on a Christian cross. These two spirals uh, marked where energies were spiraling in a church in, in, um, at Stoke Trister in, uh, in Somerset. And uh, the two energy lines came together uh, marked by that spiral of snakes. So I often find symbolism is where the energies are doing strange things. And even William Bake regarded the stairway to heaven as being a spiral, of course. It's the DNA, it's the unfolding of everything, really. So um, I do a whole massive section on all creatures, great and small, where I look through all animals and birds, and of course they've all worked their way into Christian symbolism. I'll just pick two out here. Of course, this is the lion, which they think the Sphinx originally was. There's lots of lion gods and goddesses here. And of course, Christianized with the lion story of, um, uh, of uh, Daniel, and also used as the symbol of St. Mark. And this is from Gebekli Tepe, again. Uh, this is uh, one of the pillars, and it's got a bull on it. And here's Hercules. Uh, slaying the bull in Roman myth and again the bull had to be given uh, an attribute to a Christian state. All these ancient animals and loads more if they were worshipped in ancient times they had to be brought into the Christian um, iconography so again everything comes from something else so uh, this is an interesting one. You all know that Jesus is called the Lamb of God, yeah? That's one of his names. He's the good shepherd, shepherding us, shepherd, you know, herding us all around, um, uh, divine shepherd. Uh, but the, this, these three titles are all actually from ancient times, Babylonian, Greek, Egyptian myths. There are, there are gods called the Lamb of God, the Lamb God, and the divine shepherd. Um, th this, is a Greek, this is a Greek one here, and this is a Roman one. Are we getting some sort of similarity here, I think. So again, um, you can easily see where the concept of Jesus being a good shepherd and the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, that's the point. He's being sacrificed, so therefore the lamb is perfect symbol for him. Uh, <clears throat> and again, uh, the power of the serpent, I do a whole chapter on serpents. This, of course, is the famous, this is thought to rep this is the Aztec one in British Museum, thought to represent uh, Quetzalcoatl. Uh, absolutely stunning, this, in turquoise. And, of course, this is the famous uh, Mayan temple at Chichen Itza, where I think it's on the equinox every year. The sun shines in a certain way, and look at that, just formed by the steps. Isn't that amazing? Wow. And of course, here's the serpent goddess, uh, from the Minoan state goddess. So of course, the serpent is representing the life force, the Kundalini of the planet, and also our, of ourselves. And has been taken on by dows, dowsers, especially, to represent earth energies. They really do flow like the serpents of old. <clears throat> uh, this is a, an aboriginal uh, cave art of the rainbow serpent, which I know a lot of uh, our guys have been working with. Uh, where are you, Tor? Yeah, he's going around chasing the rainbow serpent around the planet, great man. And uh, this is uh, the great serpent mound in Ohio. Again, here's the, this is a Native American one, of course. And here, the, the, it's thought that this serpent is about to swallow or he's disgorging the cosmic egg. And uh, again, which births everything. 
Uh, and of course, serpents naturally were brought into Christian architecture. Here's Moses with the brazen serpent, which he actually used for protection. Uh, this when they made it. Here's the Ouroboros. This is a, a lovely Masonic uh, carving here I've got in the book about um, the eternity of life. The serpent is biting its own tail, representing the eternal of life. Uh, this is a fabulous painting, of course. Serpents very famously featured in the, um, the Garden of Eden at the fall. Um, and he's saying, take this apple, and saying, don't do it. So again, this is depicted in a painting as a serpent. Serpents from being this uh, representation of life force in ancient cultures then became to represent evil. And that the more I see symbols that represent evil in the Bible, I know that prior to that, they usually represented something jolly good and powerful, because that's the strength that it had to be overtaken. Yeah. Um, and of course, sim symbol, uh, the caduceus occurs as a symbol of St. Luke, but again, you find it way back. This is a caduceus uh, associated with the phallic god of Priapus at Pompeii. So again, this does represent balance. You've got the male and the female, the yin and yang, and of course, it's exactly what we find traveling up uh, across the Apollo line or the Belilus line or the famous St. Michael line. We're going to deal with the Michael and Mary currents tomorrow at the tour when we go to um, the Chalice Well and Glastonbury Abbey and up the tour. So again, you can see exactly where this comes from. It's a symbol of Hermes and Mercury that was just uh, taken over by the church. And dragons, there's a whole heap of section. I love dragons. Uh, don't you just love dragons? I really do. Very powerful. Eagle. They occur right across the world. You'll have a job finding an ancient culture that doesn't deal with dragons. And, and again, this is very telling. This is a male uh, god chasing the female earth dragon away. That was to have serious consequences in Judaism later on. This is a Greek dragon. Of course, the Vikings love dragons. And of course, the Chinese. Uh, they represent dragons uh, as being the life force, the feng shui, the balance of the planet. Dragons were always, although they were often fierce, in ancient cultures they were usually benevolent. They were giving people the life force. And of course they were taken over by Christianity, but now the dragon, because it represents all the old ideals of paganism, has to be demonized. And uh, dragons aren't, don't have a bad press at all in the Bible until the book of Revelations, right at the very end. Um, the book of Revelation says that dragons, uh, these winged creatures, are the cohorts of the devil, and that is such a shame. Uh, the, the, this is St. George, of course, and St. Michael. The way you can tell them apart is that usually St. George doesn't have wings, and he has a red cross on. There are exceptions to that. Look at the dragon headdress there. And uh, this is St. Michael. You can usually tell him because he doesn't have a cross usually, and he has wings. This is the main way you can usually tell them apart. So I, I look at those two archetypal um, characters at great depth in the book. And uh, dragons occur. This is a lovely one from Horsington. This is John the Divine. He's supposed to have saved, uh, his faith saved him from uh, eating, uh, from drinking venom out of a cup. And uh, this is why he's often shown with a, a serpent. But this is a funny looking snake, isn't it, really? So again, is this chalice representing um, you know, rebirth, the earth itself, divine feminine, and the dragon is emerging from it. Look at the love, look at the wisdom. This is the Gnostic dragon. It's representing inner knowledge. And of course, the Knights Templars made sure it was um, eventually came the symbol of London. But we have dragons representing earth energies. These are two dragons, the female and the male, on the font at Abri, because of course at Abri the male and female dragons come together. Uh, this is supposed to be the bishop in the center with the Bible in his hand. To me, it looks more like a pint. I don't know about you. Uh, but these two dragons represent the male and female energies at Abri. These two serpents, there's only two serpents in the whole of credit and church, I can assure you, and it's where the Michael and Mary current come together right in front of this column. So they must have known that. They must have known something. They're the only two, or, or the other thing, I like to throw this in just because I, I like to, you know, uh, does these serpents mark where the energies were seen to cross when the column was carved, or have the energies gravitated to that column since the, the carvings were carved on there, yeah? That's an interesting concept, isn't it? We know the power of symbols. They, they create and they give off an energy which earth energies are drawn to, I can assure you. So the, the flood is another concept. Again, it occurs in Babylonian myths. It occurs in Hindu myths. Right across the board, there's the concept of a flood. 
uh, whereas, you know, we've all been naughty, so therefore the slate has to be uh, done clean. But again, it's a, this, 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 is the, uh, this is the equivalent of Noah, I forget his name, uh, in his boat, the equivalent of the flood. So again, Noah is often shown with his little ship. But the flood occurs in virtually all ancient cultures, this concept, and of course, in classical cultures, it, it survived as the, uh, as the myth of Atlantis. Um, the triple goddess reinvented, again, the, the idea of a triple female divinity is very ancient here, some Greek and Roman figurines, it's usually the, uh, the maiden, the mother and the crone, uh, here's the mother holding the baby, the, represented by the triple spiral, I believe. Lots of cultures have three women, um, uh, these are the three Valkyries taking uh, departed um, Viking warriors to Valhalla. And of course, that too had to be brought into Christianity. If you see any images of faith, hope, and charity, or mercy, justice, and humility, they are always women. It's the triple goddess brought into the church. This was a powerful icon. All the ancient cultures had the divine triple feminine, so it had to be brought into the church. You know, why isn't that a man, woman, man, or three men, you know? And uh, this is quite amazing where you see the history of this. And there's the scales again for justice, you know? Have you been naughty or have you been nice? So again, that is the triple goddess from ancient cultures. But we also have triple gods, of course. Lots of cultures have their main gods in groups of threes. There's Odin, Thor, and Freya. These are the three pure ones of Taoism. I give lots more examples. And in Christianity, this triple god works into churches as faith, courage, and devotion. Again, all macho guys, these have all got weapons yeah this is a real macho window isn't it but again it represents faith courage and devotion it's the it's the divine it's the triple god and this is one of the earliest signs uh found in the catacombs of the three magi visiting uh the the uh, madonna and child i think this is about 200 a.d this i think and they've all got the mithraean cap on this is the symbol of mithras yeah so these are mithras devotees visiting what they see as the new Mithras, the new sun god coming to town. Um, I, I, uh, with the question of the three wise men, you know, are they all, are they all men? Yeah, I look into the word magi, which goes right across Egyptian, uh, Babylonian cultures, and it's a sexual. It's neither man nor female. It's where we get the origin of magician and magic from. And in some early Christian depictions of the, the magi, they are dressed in Persian clothing. They are wise magi from the east. Uh, but one of them, it, more often than not, one of them looks very effeminate. Yeah? And I started asking myself years ago, is this a woman? You know, because let's face it, where these guys are coming from, the goddess and priestesses are just as prevalent and common as priests and the god. So why wouldn't a, a representation of the divine feminine be brought along to honor the new sun god? I, I've blown this one up. This is a window, a Dorset window. And there's this character, you know. Okay, you could say it's just a, a slave watching the camel, but that means there's only two wise men there. That's one of the wise men and she's got a heart-shaped earring on. That's not something I'd expect a, a dude from the Middle East to be wearing, I don't know. So I've got lots of images of these of where it's always just one of the wise men looks more like a wise woman. So I think the Masons, the Templars are trying to tell us something, you know, that it, well, they weren't all men. Moses is a person I greatly admire. To me, he's one of the great shamans of the Bible. Again, Moses lived in about Bronze Age time, so we can relate him to the Bronze Age shamans uh, that we know of with all the Bronze Age sites. This is the archetypal image of a druid. Uh, this is how I see Moses, really. And uh, here he is taking the tablets. Well, he's actually smashing the tablets. So Moses, again, he did lots of things that shaman do. He went on a vision quest. We, know, we think he took magic mushrooms. Uh, he, parts, he, he creates the weather. He changes the weather, which is a feature of lots of shamanic cultures, lots of shamans. He really is a magician, Moses. And um, again, he sees a burning bush. Again, he, he's been up Mount Sinai for, for weeks, and uh, um, probably with the mana, which is, we think means magic mushroom, and then he gets a vision. Well, you would, wouldn't you? So the idea is food deprivation, sleep deprivation, taking yourself off from your tribe to get the vision of the Ten Commandments or whatever he went off to. It's a classic shamanic practice. He, uh, he, he, he hits a rock one day when all the Israelites uh, uh, can't find water in the desert. He hits a rock. Uh, and water comes out. This was done by several ancient gods. Mithras very famously hits a rock and water comes out. And again, he parted the seas of the Red Sea. And uh, in my book, I discussed the theory that this might have been actually the sea receding after a tsunami. 
because uh, they found evidence of a volcano and a tsunami in the Mediterranean just at the time that Moses was kicked out. So did the sea retreat, you know, or uh, was it just a drought? So again, what you, we're looking at, of course, the Christian version of events, yeah? But um, I discuss that it was possibly a natural event in the book. Uh, Moses is often shown with horns because it's said that when he came down um, from uh, Mount Sinai, uh, he was all glowing and he had horns. And someone has recently reinterpreted, retranslated that, you know, and it said it's, it's his aura, it's like a glow, uh, these radiant beams of light, because he's connected to spirit. It's his aura glowing that everybody sees. And of course, famously, he brought down the Ten Commandments. Uh, but look at this. This is from the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead in use you know, hundreds of years, uh, about, well, sorry, about the same time as Moses um, was around, and Moses would have been aware of this. You know, Moses, if he is the Prince Tut Moses, which you think he was, the prince that was chucked out, he would have been aware of this. He was a priest, you know, and a prince who was in training. So is this where he got the Ten Commandments from? Look at this. I've done no falsehood, I've not robbed, I've not committed perjury, etc., etc. I've not killed men. This is the Ten Commandments because he was aware of them. This, this is from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So that's where Moses got the commandments from. He already knew them. <laughs> um, so uh, Moses does a lot of his magic, like good old wizards and Merlin and Gandalf with his staff. Again, lots of precedents for this. Patath, the Egyptian god, always has a staff. This is in Birmingham Museum. This was found on Mount Nebob, where Moses uh, was buried in an excavation in 1839 and inscribed on it in hieroglyphs is Tough Moses. It's him, it's his staff. This is in Birmingham Museum and I've been up to see it and photograph it. So a lot of uh, academics think this is actually the staff from the Moses myth, isn't that amazing? It's in Birmingham, my hometown. And the, 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 the staff of Moses is in Birmingham. Isn't that fabulous? Go up and see it. It's on show now. And the, the archaeological evidence exactly fits the biblical story. Isn't that amazing? So go see. The Holy Grail, of course, again, very much in tune with Glastonbury. I haven't got much chance to go into it now, but of course there's lots of ancient magical cups. Uh, this is a Muslim tale of a magical cup with the elixir of life. This isn't actually Pandora's box, this is Circe opening another box. Uh, Venus had sent Circe because she was jealous of her beauty into the underworld to bring back this box that would make Venus um, more beautiful again. But of course, how could Circe resist opening that? Uh, and of course, the famous Gunderstob cauldron features Bran, we think, uh, dipping people into dead warriors into the cauldron of rebirth uh, to be reborn again. So the Grail is a, a prehistoric concept, certainly is. And of course, um, we'll deal with the Grail tomorrow on the tour. Uh, very much brought into Christianity via Arthur. This is, a, this, is, this is exactly on a ley line between Glastonbury and Stonehenge that I discovered a few years ago. This is a window at Longbridge Deverell. Uh, exactly on the lay from Stonehenge to Avery. Here is the vision King Arthur longed for to see. And of course, in this concept, it's, it's a moment of enlightenment. As you know, you know when, when, um, when uh, Arthur drinks from the crop, he and the, uh, the uh, land are healed. And this, of course, Joseph of Arimathea in St. John's with the, uh, the two little cups supposed to hold Jesus' blood and his sweat. And again, this one I found, this is uh, near Valencia, I think. This is actually they think uh, if, the, if there is an historical grail they think this could be it because this actually dates back uh, from the time of Jesus believe it or not <laughs> it, it's not a modern replica so I, I look at all the modern equivalents that, that, that the candidates that have been put forward uh, as the grail but of course I think the grail isn't a physical object at all I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint all you grail hunters I think it's about enlightenment. It's about that attainment of Gnosis. And it famously occurs in the Garden of Eden. You find images of this all over the place. Here's an angel coming out of the sky with the grail. You know, he's not giving him a nightcap. It's not a half a guineas in there, you know. It's, uh, it's his moment of Gnosis. Here he is meditating. The grail represents the moment when Jesus gets it. He knows he's not going to die. He knows his soul is eternal. That's what the Grail represents. It's, it's that moment of Gnosis within all of us. So we can all attain the Grail, every one of us. So um, the sun god of the ancients, of course, many, uh, the sun god was perhaps the, the chief uh, 
um, study, uh, reverence object in ancient cultures. So, of course, it had to be replaced. And, of course, the person who replaced the ancient sun gods was Jesus. So the sun god uh, turns into the son of God. So Jesus took over from the sun gods as the new divine masculine solar deity. Again, these are two ancient images. I could, e I could easily say that these were early Roman depictions of Jesus with his wonderful halo. They are not. They're Apollo and Helios, the ancient sun gods. More examples here. Again, where have we seen that before? Baby suckling on the breast. This is Mithras emerging from the cave after he's been reborn. Roman god and here's uh, Apollo. And look at this one. I found this Mesopotamian image. This is 3000 BC of this dude holding a cross. Okay, it's an ancient sun symbol, the cross. Um, so question, who was famously born on December the 25th to a virgin mother, died and arose three days later? It was? Yes. Jesus. But hang on a second. <laughs> um, December the, th the 35th to a virgin mother, resurrection. Oh, there should be, these have moved over. That's um, obviously not about, the, I've got... 15 gods here, all born on December the 25th to a virgin mother. I'm sorry that some of them have... Um, sorry? Mithra. Mithra, yes, he's under there somewhere. This picture has moved over in, the trans, in try, my, trying to read my, my slideshow. Mithras, Osiris, Horus, Krishna, Attis, and several more. So Jesus is not the reason for the season, I'm afraid. Uh, he's much, much older. And uh, look at all these gods and heroes. These are all associated with ancient gods. Fish, sheep, rams, wine miracles, healing, palm leaves, walking on water, all been done before, I'm afraid, Jesus. Rebirth after three days. Uh, all these are ancient names I found in ancient gods. These are nothing to do with Jesus. The invincible son, lamb of God, fisher of men, shepherd. It was, they, those ancient attributes were just given to Jesus. Why wouldn't you? There's Osiris, born to a virgin mother, rode triumphantly into town on a donkey, Osiris, yay. Is sacrificed in the spring, Easter, reborn after three days. I'm not saying for any reason, I'm not even implying that the Jesus story didn't happen. I sincerely hope it did, or else Christ. And, and, but <laughs> but um, it makes sense to put the attributes of the, God, the new demigod that you are pushing to give it the attributes of the old gods, then it gives him more authority. Yeah, that's the idea. Look at Bacchus uh, and Dionysus, born on December 25th to a virgin mother, impregnated by Zeus, therefore he's the son of God, the god of the vine, the fish, and he had the power to turn wine to water. So where have we heard that before? So uh, amazing, isn't it? Look at the symbols of uh, this. You, remember, you see this a lot in churches, don't you? I-H-S. Uh, the first three letters of Jesus in Greece, or it represents Jesus homini salvator, the saviour of humanity in Latin. But these are also the emblems that were put on the temple of Bacchus. Uh, the, the Bacchus temples had H-I-S on them. In Phoenician, I-E-S. But if you transfer that to Greek, it's I-H-S. So this is the ancient symbol of Bacchus brought into the churches. Fab, isn't it? And we have this very controversial tablet where it's supposed to be the earliest con uh, scene of the crucifixion. But the words on the side of it are Orpheus Bacchicus. Yeah, it's the ancient sun god on the cruis. There's the divine feminine symbol above and it's coming out of the vulva or going into the vulva at the bottom. And I also found this one. This is three, uh, sorry, nine, ninth century BC, 900 years before the time of Christ, there's a cross. Okay, so everything comes from something else. Ancient sun crosses all across the ancient world. There's just a few. And even the ancient designs of megaliths were brought into church design. And was Jesus a shaman? I think he was. Uh, I found this window where Jesus is surrounded by magic mushrooms. Yay! Adam and Eve win uh, painting here. They're not at the tree of life. Is a load of mushrooms. Yeah, and even in, the, in this Moses story, uh, this famous mana was supposed to be taken, collected in the desert before the sun rose and shriveled them up. They're magic mushrooms. Uh, the, the, the term for Jesus, Jesus you might know is called the Nazarene. It means to behold or envision. It doesn't mean he's from Nazareth at all. So, um, fabulous, isn't it? I found this lovely comparison. There's Archonatum, who believed in the one God, as you know, a very similar depiction of Jesus, getting the rays of enlightenment coming down. So um, I'm going to skip that one because I know time's going on. I'm going to go to that one. So there's actually no historical evidence for Jesus, but this in no way devalues his message. Did Jesus live? Does it matter? 
Does it matter? In conclusion, although uh, I do not seek to deny anybody their faith, anybody believing that Jesus lived and breathed around 2,000 years ago has to do so despite the evidence, not because of it. But perhaps in terms of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and the Grail and other myths, we should not inquire as to whether a myth is historically accurate, but is it just in, it's spiritually valid? Yeah, is it just spiritually valid? This is supposed to be the transfiguration where the, Jesus appears to the disciples and he morphs. He, also alongside him are Moses and Elijah. The reason that Christians do this is because they want to put their prophet you know, on an equal basis to the old prophets. But I think they're just showing his previous reincarnations. It's his previous light bodies turning up. He was Moses. He was Elijah. And of course we have the divine feminine represented by uh, lots of ancient sites by the moon, of course, uh, and there's the moon goddess in many cultures, um, represented right back to 35,000 BC, known as the queen of heaven in a lot of ancient cultures. But who was going to replace the queen of heaven? Well, of course, it's the queen of heaven. The Virgin Mary, one of her names is the queen of heaven. She's standing on the, the, uh, the moon beams here. She's always in blue and white. It doesn't represent purity. It represents the water and the moon. That's what the colors represent the waters and the moon. And of course, there's the earth mother goddess. And uh, this idea, you know, the archetypal image of Jesus sitting on, the Mary, on Mary's lap. Of course, it's everywhere. Babylonian, Hittite, uh, Romanian, Malta. It, it's such an ancient uh, of the goddess with the solar god on her lap. And of course, there's a good example from Egypt, classical times, Hindu mythology. They are all there. And of course, at the end of that chapter, I show Isis and Horus, uh, the Roman equivalent of there, and Jesus and Mary. It's such a powerful symbol. You can see why they adopted it. But to me, all the fun starts with the divine marriage. Yay. When the yin and yang come together. Again, this is an ancient concept. All these old gods and goddesses are getting together for the fertility of the earth. Um, Lilith there, and the, the famous Naga of, um, of India. And of course, it's Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, the Council of Nicaea in, in 325 proclaimed lead Jesus as divine. He wasn't regarded as divine before 325 AD. He was just a great prophet. And of course, if you're divine, you can't be married, you can't have kids or anything like that. That would make you merely human. Uh, and I started looking at Mary Magdalene. Of course, a lot of this has been in the Da Vinci Code. But of course, you know, Mary famously with her alabaster jar does Jesus' feet and he, he, he uh, gives him anointing just before. It's, an, it's, a, it's a priest ritual anointing a future king. Um, that's what it is. And some fabulous images of Mary Magdalene. Again, who, who, who is the only figure ever shown at the foot of the cross? It's Mary Magdalene because the Romans would only allow the wife of a crucified victim to be at the foot of the cross. So that one got left in. I love this, Joseph of Arimathea lifting Jesus' body. Who did Jesus appear to? Mary Magdalene when he rose, because it's his missus. Why wouldn't he? He'd get a bollocking, really, if he didn't, if it wasn't. His. So, and he addresses her as, as rabbi. And as you know, in Jewish tradition, rabbis have to be married. It's a sign of their respectability of procreation. Jesus was married. It would make him more acceptable as a rabbi and a priest. Again, there's the famous ritual. The sacred marriage ritual occurs in Hebrew and Sumerian uh, texts and also by Egyptian priestesses. I found out that at that time, he, Hebrew law said if a woman, any woman, touches another man in any form, they just take her out and stone her, unless it's his husband or his wife. So she must have been his wife to, be, to do all that, because they'd have taken out. I found images like this. Um, you know, what state is this lady in? She's pregnant. She's resting the jar on her, on her, uh, her tummy. This is the famous one, of course, from the island of Mole. She is clearly in a state of pregnancy. Look at that. This is the newlyweds, really. This is the married couple. The perfect balance of yin and yang, the divine couple. And I found this in a, in a night's hospital, a church in, in, um, in Winchester. This is said to be... Uh, Mary the mother and Jesus, Jesus, and I'm thinking, do me a favor. She's in red, long red hair. This is Mary Magdalene and her child. And this is the one I think that's really going to cause a stir because I'm not aware anybody has found a window like this before. This is the scene of the crucifixion. This is Mary Magdalene with a crown on long blonde hair. She's the only character in church architecture that's ever shown like that, holding a baby up to the crucified Christ. This is in Cornwall. I think this is going to cause quite a stir. John the Baptist in the Bible hailed Jesus as the bridegroom. 
Why the hell would he do that? And in Matthew, Jesus is said, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? That's in the Bible. So I've almost finished now. Living in balance and harmony, it's an ancient ideal, yin and yang, but I think it's about reclaiming our power. I think it's time to wake up after this 2,000-year-old slumber. When I take groups around Avery, I see balance. Yang, yin, yang, yin, yang, yin. It's all about balance. And even today, in other cultures, the Pachamama culture, you have the male and the female, Shiva and Shakti, but we don't do it in Christianity. The divine um, feminine has been demonized. Also in India, the lingam and the yoni, you have to have the two together. And I call this one rock bottom. <laughs> what on earth have we been up to the last 2,000 years? Uh, what the hell were we up to on Thursday is a good question. Right. But what the hell have we been up to the last 2,000 years? Uh, we have reached a bit of a rock bottom, but I've got proof of global warming now. <laughs> okay? As, as the climate gets warmer, the smalls get smaller. How can anybody argue with this piece of scientific evidence? And when I last spoke at Megalithmania, um, Somebody asked, we had time for questions, which isn't going to happen today. Uh, and somebody asked a question, Pete, what's the most sacred site you've ever been to? And after hesitating for a few minutes, I says, well, actually, the most sacred site I have ever been to in my life is this one. Isn't she beautiful? So the earth, is she a symbol of man's folly, of disrespect, of all that we have destroyed and are still destroying? Or can she be seen as a symbol of hope, of the ever-giving mother, of love? She owes us nothing, don't forget, yeah? We owe her everything. Perhaps it's time to give something back. So I'm just going to say, finally, perhaps when we realize the true value of symbols, will pictures really begin to tell a thousand words? And the real power of myths, I believe, is that they possess the ability to engage not just the mind, but also the heart and our very soul. Thank you very much.